welcome to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. The inaugural GT Live is history in the making, showcasing the first U.S. appearance of Japan's top form of racing, the Japan Grand Touring Championship, and the long-awaited East vs. West D1 Grand Prix, a contest between the best drifters in Japan versus the best sideways racers in the U.S. To help me wrangle these two piston-popping days of automotive madness down to an hour are our field correspondents, Alan DeCadene and Steve Magnante. Alan is known around the world for building and racing GT cars, and Steve is a former editor of Hot Rod Magazine and a guy who can have fun with anything on four wheels. Over the last two days, the California Speedway has been transformed from a NASCAR track into the world's largest automotive theme park. Multiple events running simultaneously make this a Disneyland for car guys. Steve is down with GT Live's organizer right now to figure out what's going on. I'm here with Randy Groob, who is basically the father of the GT Live event. Randy, how did this whole thing get started? I was in Japan three years ago at a race uh, where they were racing JGTC, and I heard the NSX uh, engine, and that's all it took. It, at the time, they were running a normally aspirated 3-liter, and it sounds like a Ferrari, and it was just awesome. And the cars look great, and ever since then, I had this bug in my ear, and I wanted to do something, and it led to this. Now, I know that there's a lot of famous people here who are very, very famous in Japan. Was it tough to get them here? It was tough to get stuff over here. Uh, they did, the biggest thing, actually, was when we first approached the GT Association, they wouldn't believe me that this would work here. But it did. In order to pull a substantial crowd to GT Live's inaugural event, Randy decided to stray from the typical road race format and let the fans become part of the action. <laughs> what brought you out here today? Oh, the drifting and the GT races. How about the ladies? Ladies definitely good. Surprisingly, the ladies aren't the only draw. Kicking off the drifting was America's newest drift series, the Extreme Drifting League. Allen's over trackside to get the inside edge on the XDL. Drifting as we know it today may have had its origins in Japan, but believe me, it's caught on really big time here in America. And if anyone wants any proof of that, just look at all the tricked out machinery here, ready to go and show us how it's all done. Today, any race car driver will tell you that sliding around bends of burning rubber slows you down. But so what? Drifters don't care about that. Drifters care about putting on a great show and looking good. In 2004, drifting caught traction here in the States, and after only a year of competition, the U.S. is turning out some of the world's top drifters. Some of the best from the U.S. and Japan came out at GT Live to be a part of America's newest drift experience, the Extreme Drifting League, presented by Falcon Tires. Unlike other sideways events, the XDL removes the judge competition and focuses in on the art of drifting. Using the course as a blank canvas, the XDL uses drifting as performance art for the ultimate automotive show-off event. In essence, it's like the snowboard half-pipe of drifting. With the help of Falcon Tires and Antonio Alvandia, the XDL used their brief time at GT Live to tell the history of drifting in Japan. They began with the sport's origins in rally racing, illegal street racing, and then finally getting organized with the D1 Grand Prix. This was a killer exhibition for this premiere series, and I'm sure we'll be trackside at all of their events this year. Drifting strictly for show is a concept that is exciting both to the drivers and the fans, making the XDL a sure bet for a good time in the upcoming year. The drifting here at GT Live is intense, and this is just the first of many drifting events to come here this weekend. Coming up, we're going to learn a little of the backstory on the JGTC and check out a little more D1 drifting, so stick around. For more information and to purchase official GT Live merchandise, log on to JGTCUSA.net. Inside GT Live is brought to you by Subaru, designed from the ground up with symmetrical all-wheel drive standard. Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. The midway was crazy during the day with 45,000 young people soaking in the best of what the tuner hobby has to offer. Steve was in the middle of the madness all day, getting in on as much of the action as possible and making a ton of new friends along the way. 
The years at Princeton, the hard work, the PhD, was it wasted? No, it wasn't. I'm going to get slapped. I know that. <laughs> Is it tough having all us all guys leer at you all day long, or what's that like? I'm being a sexist pig. I'm sorry. Becoming part of the action is the big draw to GT Live, so Steve battled 1,500 fans to get his hands on a Nissan or Mazda and try to decipher what the steering wheel is for over at the Ride and Drive. This weekend's main event is the all-star race of the Japan Grand Touring Championship. The JGTC is an international FIA GT series who, after conquering the finest tracks in the Far East, has brought their battle to the West. This championship was created back in 1994 as a high-tech formula within Japanese motorsport. But the main reason why it's really caught on so big time is because of the amazing adoration of the fans. In just 10 years, the JGTC has evolved into Japan's most respected race series and has produced the fastest GT cars in the world. The Japanese Touring Car Championship basically has two classes, GT500 and GT300. This is a GT500 car. Why 500? Well, because the engines are restricted to a maximum of 500 horsepower. Eric Comas is a French-born Formula Formula One driver and two-time champion in the JGTC. I ran into him in the pit garages where he took us on a tour of his GT500 350Z. Since this section only is uh, from uh, the car, original car, stock car, meaning the roof, the floor, and the doors, which obviously are carbon fiber, still you get the doors handle, which are from the Z car. They are exactly the same you will buy, but that's about it. Formula One uh, rear axle transmission. Pretty much the same as you can find in Formula One. And we got on the front the, the V6 engine, which is um, uh, the original V6, but with a twin turbo charger, and which has been moved backward in order to get a, a very good uh, weight distribution. This is a GT300. It's really much more of a production car. You have to keep the original chassis platform, the original body style of platform, and you also have to keep basically the original front end and back end, but you can tune it. And that's the whole point of the GT300. They are restricted on the engines to 300 horsepower. And there's a lot of difference between the two categories. Exciting racing is what drives the fans, and the rules are written to keep the action close. JGTC teams have mandatory pit stops and driver changes, putting the emphasis on teamwork and strategy over individual driving skill. With each win, the teams are given weight penalties and restrictors to keep the cars as even as possible throughout the season. Teams work tirelessly to create the fastest GT cars in the world and are constantly improving their technology. We got the inside scoop from Bruce Junet, one of the Europeans driving for the Raybury NSX team. They're really light, the engines are really, really fine-tuned by Japanese people who are making and taking the best of all the equipment and uh, making, making them so fast. It's, it's for a driver, when you're expecting racing in the top technology, that is what you're looking for, which makes it one of the strongest championships around and probably the strongest GT championship you could find on, on the planet. The good news for us is this event is an invitation-only all-star race, so the JGTC has allowed the team to remove all of their restrictors, so we can expect an unparalleled no-limits race. The start of any race is always the most exciting, so don't go away. We'll be right back with more from GT Live. Inside GT Live is brought to you by Subaru, designed from the ground up with symmetrical all-wheel drives. Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. Alan's down on pit lane, getting ready for the start of the JGTC All-Star 200. Well, this is it. The cars are all pre-gridded now, one-on-one. -on -one. The engineers have done everything possible to make sure that each one is absolutely on the point checked all the tires and make sure all the pressures are right, fuel, oil, driver strategy, everything's been done. And yet, whilst it's all very serious, of course, this is a motor race, 
There's a kind of air of celebration here. It's the end of the season for these Japanese GT Championship guys, and this is a race I think they are all going to thoroughly enjoy, and I certainly hope so. While Alan's busy on pit lane, Steve's over on Vendor Row making his way through the crowd. Here at GT Live, it's a sea of humanity, and let's see what these manatees are up to. What was your favorite spectacle here so far? Other than the cars, probably the ladies, all the, uh, you know, umbrella girls. <laughs> That's what everybody's saying. Let's go find some. <laughs> Where's your lady? You bring a lady today? Uh, no. <laughs> Maybe you'll find one here, right? Yeah, most likely. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be on TV? <laughs> well, you are now. That's too bad. Oh, yeah, you know, I like cars. They go ram ram. I'm like a growing fan of like grip and formula or like uh, circuit driving, so GGTC was my thing. At GT Live, everyone had a chance to become part of the racing action. This is a brand new go-kart track at California Speedway, and we operate schools and races here so people can just show up and drive all the way up to advanced courses to really learn how to become a professional karting driver. Well, can I try it? Yeah, we're here. We got the carts, we got the track. Let's go race. All right. All right. Watching the first ever US based JGTC All Star 200 at the California Speedway. I'm Alan Bolte, your race circuit commentator, and I've got Alan DeCadney down in the pits, and helping me out up in the booth is my good friend, Bruce Flanders. As they come by, please wave something at them. Let them know you're up there and watching. They're on approach to you now. The JGTC uses a rolling start with the cars gridded in the order that they qualify. And teams use at least two drivers, and in this race, some will use three. So to keep it close, each team must make two mandatory pit stops. And the pit stops don't count until after lap 15. The all-star competitors will make 87 laps on this 2.3-mile road course to complete the 200-mile race. Green, green, green. There they go, thundering through the green flag. This is the Subaru onboard camera of Benoit Trellier and the 12 Kelsonic car as he knocks it down a couple of gears, chasing the pole sitter Satoshi Mogiyama through the chicane. This is the Subaru onboard cam of James Courtney running in third in his V8 powered Toyota Supra. Everyone's staying pretty close up front, but Andre Lauderer is pushing the 22 car. There's Lauderer cutting to the inside, but he's not going to make it. We are still on that one, and there's already a spin. It will put him at the back of the GT500 pack right from the get-go. This is the Subaru on board with our race leader and pole sitter with the number one, Zanabi Nismo Z. The lead car is tighter than four mules in a side-bound harness and already pulling away from the pack. Fighting for position and looking for an opportunity here, the number 12, Calsonic Z. Leading the GT300 pack through lap one with no one else in sight is the number one qualifier, Morio Nita, and his awesome Autobox Garaya. Leading the race and blasting into lap two is number one qualifier, Satoshi Motoyama. Motoyama, incidentally, is the two-year reigning JGTC champion and the odds-on favorite for the all-star race here in the U.S. Alan caught up with Motoyama right before the race. Tell me a little bit about your car. It looks beautifully built. I'd like to know more about it. Our new 350Z is really fast, and the aerodynamics are great. With the twin-turbo setup from last year, it's really got a lot of potential. You obviously much enjoy driving for the Nissan Works team. That's a great honor, I would say, and that uh, you obviously have probably the best team here. We may have won the championship this year, but I never take for granted that I have a great team, a great partner, and a great car. It's all a driver could ask for. I'm really very happy. 
10 cars are working on lap 11. The rest of the field working on lap 10. The 500 cars are catching up to the smaller cars now, and that's going to create traffic for everyone. The battle rages on here at the California Speedway, and the fun continues at the world's largest automotive theme park. More action after this on Inside GT Live. Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. There was a whole lot more than racing going on at GT Live, and this was proven with the generous amount of cute women on hand. So we sent our most eligible bachelor out to interview them all. There's a drought. They smell me. They can smell me. They've cleared out. I show up and people <clears throat> I show up and people clear out. What is this? Ah, what's going on right here? Hello, sir. How are you? You're here at the GT Live show. Were you here yesterday, too? Yes, I was. Saturday and Sunday attendance, both days. That's cool. What are your favorite things here at the show? All the cars in Formula Drift that did the demo yesterday. What are some of your favorite things you've seen so far? Kick. Here at GT Live, there are plenty of race queens and plenty of trailer queens. And while I prefer the race queens myself, yeah, yeah, yeah. check out some of these show cars courtesy of Super Street Magazine's car show presented by Rockford Fosgate. Let's go back up to the booth to check out more of last night's main event. We're on lap number 11, and the faster 500 cars are blasting their way through the smaller 300 traffic. The early 300 leader is off, getting towed back to the pits with a fuel leak. His race over, but uh, things are just starting to cook at California Speedway. The lead cars are still in their qualifying order. The number 12 car shoots the gap, and he's taken first place. A great piece of outbreaking as he squeaks by on the inside. First lead change of the race. Motoyama is not backing down, going inside of Courtney on his flank, side by side, going in. And there's contact between Courtney and the number one Z. The Z's been T-boned by the Takata Dome NSX. Traffic is flowing around them. Let's watch as they both try to get back into the race. Working his way through lap 11 is your new leader in the GT300, the 16 car. He got the lead after the 43 car went out. The number one and 18 cars are still struggling to recover from their earlier contact. Let's watch the replay and find out what happened. After being thoroughly outbraked by the 12 car, Motoyama scrambled to get back in. However, James Courtney sneaked in on the inside and punted the number one qualifier right into traffic. The Zanabi Z was then T-boned by the Takata Dome NSX, and just like that, the race lead was changed. Both cars seem able to run, but they are just limping back to the pits now. Let's go to Alan, who is down on pit lane with the number one Nismo team. Yeah, this is the number one Nissan car. He was leading the race, of course, and, and then he was punted into in the side of the car, and that's obviously damaged something quite severely. And that's the end of their race, I would suggest, because by, by the time they get that car fixed, it'll be too late. Just as we suspected, the number one Nismo car is out, and the 18 car looks as though it is in the pits to stay. Driver Rio Mishigami out of the car and talking to the team manager. It's lap 15, and the GT500 teams have decided to use the full course caution to come in for their first pit stop. Reminding you again as you watch them, possibly for their first time making a serious pit stop, they cannot change tires and add fuel at the same time. Choose one. What's interesting here is that the rules state in order for this to count as one of the two mandatory pit stops, teams would need to stop after lap 15, not on lap 15. We'll have to see how the GT Association decides to call this one. The smaller cars have begun to pit with the GT300 leader, the MTech NSX, in first. And now our GT500 guys getting back onto the track, led by the number 12, Calsonic Z. Leading now and working on lap 16 is the number 12 Calsonic Z, the number 22 Mo Tool Z, the 100 NSX close behind. Scrambling to get out of the pit lane is going to be the 37 car, and then the 32, and finally the 35 Dereza Supra. 
There's more drifting, racing, and fun here at the California Speedway. More from GT Live after this. Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. Steve is accustomed to life on a smaller scale, so he went over to the RC track where they held one-tenth scale JGTC body races throughout the day. I'm not so good at road racing, never was good at coloring inside of the lines, but even good at drifting. Let's find out. Let's go back to Alan, who's under caution, and catch up with what's happened at the All-Star 200. Catching up to the action, Courtney spun the Nismo Z all the way around, and there he was T-boned by the Takata Dome NSX. Both of those cars are out for the remainder of the race. Right now, most of the race leaders have come in for their first pit stop, and we're still under yellow, waiting for green. Back here they come down pit lane and we are green, green, green on the racetrack. We're back to full green racing. Leading lap 16 is the number 12, Calsonic Z, with only the GT300 cars on his tail. There's a battle for fifth with the 37 car of James Courtney nose to tail with the Pia NSX. Now watch out for the fact that the GT500s are interspersed with the GT300s now. Some very fast cars. Uh, are going to be making their way through traffic. The GT500s have completed 20 laps. Most of the GT300s have completed 19. Courtney, currently running with no headlights, is gaining ground on the eight car. Courtney shoots to the inside, not much of a gap, and leaves behind the fifth and sixth place. Courtney, a former Formula 3 driver, enjoying his first year in the JGTC. It's the first year I've done... Uh like to learn sort of GT prototypes sort of racing. So previously I've been with Formula cars like Formula 4, Formula 3, and did a bit of Formula 1 test driving for three years. So um, yeah, it's, it's great. I forgot what real racing was like, because with Formula cars you look at trying to pass them and the wheel rips off or the wing brakes or something. So it's good to be able to, when there's half the hole, throw the whole car in there and make a bit more room. So yeah, it's a lot more exciting from the driver's point of view and also for the spectators. Lap 21 and Courtney's hard charging down the front straight and now gunning for another former open wheel racer, Shinji Nakano. You've got plenty of bodywork around you that you can use in the race, uh, plenty of power, the cars are really sexy looking, um, sound great, look good, go good, so it's not really much more good. More contact with Courtney, this time sending Nakano into a spin. Looks like he'll be right back in it, but he's lost valuable ground. This is the second time this race, Courtney has bumped a car off the track on this corner. First on lap number 11 with the number one Nismo car, and now with the 100 Ray Brig NSX. Here's a guy in this series who has a reputation for doing a little more bumping on the track than the Japanese drivers. That has definitely been the case here tonight. That driver, James Courtney, told me that this course it's particularly narrow, really difficult to pass, and really bumpy, too. With such a tight and bumpy course, staying glued to the seat is imperative. We spoke with Mel Songo, who's the American rep for Brig, the top seat manufacturer in Japan. The reputation that we have in Japan is probably the premier seat for, for the JGTC, for Jemakana, for, for a lot of circuit racing. Brig chose the JGTC as their platform to showcase their products. We do a lot of testing. We use a lot of the feedback from the racers on the track so we can actually produce the best seat out there. Working on lap 23 is the new GT300 leader, the Aspera Drink RX7, Rari Emilia. This is Mazda's only 300 entry and has a huge enthusiast following, incidentally, here in the United States. Alan had a look at the famed FD RX7 in the pit garages. Now this is a Mazda RX7. And Isami Amamiya is a true god amongst rotary engine affectionados. There's a three-rotor unit in there producing, well, 300 horsepower. 
And let me tell you, if you don't recognize this car by sight, then you see it, then you will definitely recognize it by sound. The 12 car headed for the pits, making the number 22 Motul Z the new leader. Also off the track and making a driver change is the famed 19 Wed Sports Celica. A couple of D1 drifters driving this car today. The 19 Celica is the first car to be sponsored by an American company, Muscle Machines, stepping up and helping out to bring this car to the States. Muscle Machines makes killer die-cast cars based on the stars of the JGTC. So make sure to say thanks to them for getting these guys over here. Let's go to Alan, who's down on pit lane. We're about of a third of the way through the race now, and we've got the pitwork Nissan 350Z in the lead. Sonic 350Z that was leading before the pit stop that we saw it make, that is starting to catch up. So it's all very close, very exciting. JGTC Racing is off the hook. When we get back, we're going to pit the top tuners in the world against each other in a world-class tutor time attack. Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. How are you liking it so far? Pretty awesome, man. And what's your favorite part of this event here so far? Well, besides the girls? Ah. Ah. As we've seen, the future of racing is in these young faces, and the newest competition to hit the scene is Time Attack. These are the fastest tuner cars in the world, built by the best shops in the business, duking it out for top honors. Steve is over with the Time Attackers now. For years, hot riders and tuners have been bragging about horsepower this and torque that. Well, now they can finally put their money where their mouth is and go toe-to-toe -to -toe thanks to Tuner Time Attack. Yokohama's GT Tuner Time Attack is a race based on lap times, so it's the quickest combo of car and driver that takes home the bragging rights. These cars are tuned to the hilt and have some of the fastest guys in the industry behind the wheel. I spoke with Emil Barre about the awesome Sparco Evo. Tell me about your car. Well, Steve, uh, this is basically Mitsubishi Evo 8, Evolution 8, as it came from the factory, bought at a dealership, extensively modified. The motor's got serious upgrades, big turbo, a lot of work, internal work as well, producing about 430 horsepower at the wheels. How long is the course, and what kind of speeds do you turn out there? The course is probably about a mile and a half in length. Uh, it's a pretty fast course for an infield course. On the back straight, we're we topped out in fifth gear, so in this car, with the gearing that we have and the tires that we're running, it's probably about 155, 165 miles an hour. Though there were a mix of cars on the track, four of the top six fastest times belonged to Evo 8s. Their dominance on the track rivaled only by Nissan's venerable skyline. In the end, no one could come close to the skills of GT Live Ironman Tarzan Yamada. Tarzan raced in the GT300, went drifting with Formula D, and then took the top three spots at the time attack driving three different cars. Let's go back to the main event. There are only a few laps left. We're back to racing on lap 29, and sparks are flying from the 80 car, the endless 350Z. We can't quite see why. Yeah, that'd be the reason. The number 80 car running on three wheels. Doesn't look like the rotor is touching. As long as he makes it to the pit under his own power, he may be able to get back in this race. Into traffic, coming down the front straight, and there's contact between the 22 and the 7 car. The 22 car into the barrier of the chicane. There's the 300 leader still battling traffic, and oh, he's up and over the tire wall. Unbelievable. The endless 350Z coming into the pits. Looks like they have one tire out for him. Going to put the right rear back on for him, maybe this time with a lug nut. The REM Amiya RX-7 coming down pit lane, and with pieces of the car falling off, it doesn't look like he's going to be able to get back into the race. There goes our friend, the 80 car, all wheels intact. Let's wish him better luck on this lap. 
After all this drama, its last 34 in the Fiat car is now our solid leader in the GT500. It's only going to get better. We've still got the D1 Grand Prix and the exciting conclusion of last night's main event. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Inside GT Live is brought to you by Subaru. Designed from the ground up with symmetrical all-wheel drive standard. Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. There's something to experience for everyone here at GT Live, from six-year-olds to people that act like six-year-olds. Where's the chicks at? With all these young race fans running around. Sometimes these things have a reputation for rowdy, insane children. Steve did the best he could to get inside their young minds. What are your favorite uh, aspects of today's show? Uh, had to be the, um, the snow cones. The snow cones, and that was probably the biggest hit with you guys. Snow cones. <laughs> well, thanks for bringing the family out. This is a family event. Proof positive right here. When you, when you are full throttle, you do throttle oversteer into the turn, uh, how many degrees of, uh, of uh, rotation do you prefer? <laughs> GT Live is a family event. And if Steve's lucky, maybe one of these young families will bring him home. I think he could use the attention. I'm 40, you know, what do you want? So. Let's check in with Alan and see what's going on with the All-Star 200. As the Calsonic into the pits, car number 12, with three quarters of the way through the race, Benoit Chaleur is going to get out. He's done the whole thing so far. You see the fuel line jammed into the side of the car there. The air's coming out the top. The fuel's going in at the bottom. They've already put the new rear tires on. Bridgestones have done very well, lasted nicely. Driver's settled in the car, he's got his seat belts on. OK, the fuel line's out, the fronts are now going on. They're changing those. No brake pad change here. A perfectly normal straight line right right off the jacks. And he's out the pits in a load of wheel spin and dust. He'll have dropped down, but I think he'll probably be able to catch up. Yeah, this is the lead car now that's coming to the pits, car number three. It's a routine driver change. Derek Komas getting out. Toshihiro Kanashi getting in. Another fresh set of uh, bridge stones going on the rear. The front of that off the jacks. Very straightforward pit stop. No problems with that car. And it appears as though we've got all but three of the original starters still out on the racetrack, hammering away. The battle rages on here at the California Speedway. We've got D1 drifting and the end of the main event coming up, so stick around. Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. People had favorites everywhere, and our camera guys were no exception. With an abundance of eye candy floating around, it's amazing that people even remembered the cars. What is your favorite car? What would it be? 240SX. GDR. Yeah, Nissan GDR is Skyline. Skyline. STI. Right, how about like a Hemi Cooter or a Roadrunner? Oh, you guys are right, though. That's the wave of the future. The absolute wave of the future. So, well, thanks for coming out today. All right. No Roadrunners, no Hemi Cooters. Oh, well. While Steve dreams of big blocks, Alan's over at the D1 getting ready for the competition. The sport that we see as drifting today first came about in Japan some 30-odd years ago. The guys that wanted to do it back then had to head up into the mountains and just have themselves some fun, which they did. They learned a lot. But eventually, the cops chased them out of the mountains and they found themselves having to go, well, anywhere, like a parking lot or a racetrack, so they could just get on with it. Well, in 1986, it all got organized and it has evolved since then into the true spectacle that we see today. And that is precisely what we're going to witness right here at the California Speedway. The action was smoking at the inaugural East versus West D1 Grand Prix. D1 is the highest level of drifting in the world and the best from the series has brought their fight to America. Sunday night, the fight began. D1 starts with a series of judged single runs. The judges pick the top 16 drivers, who then move on to the tandem part of the competition. 
Right now we're qualifying, so one at a time, you just try to meet the judge's needs. So the judge is asking you really to do a few things, to go as fast as you can, so speed, line, you want a racing line through the track, and slip angle, or how sideways you are while you're driving through the track. They're gonna go from eight top um, Americans, eight top Japanese guys, they're gonna tandem drift battling down to eight, down to four, down to two, and then we're gonna crown the champion here tonight. And it's the tandem battles the fans come to see. This head-to-head -head style of drifting is judged by the same principles as the solo game, but this time as a twin car battle. Competition includes the best of two runs, giving each car a chance to begin in the lead position. The front car sets the pace and slip angle and tries to shake off the trailing car with a variety of strategies. Usually, they go into the turn as fast and as sideways as possible, trying to lose the rear car. Trailing car must stay as close as they can, always keeping the lead car in their sights, constantly putting pressure on the other driver to perform and hopefully spin out. If they manage a pass, they automatically win. The Americans that made it to the twin drift held their own against the much more experienced Japanese drifters. The first round of 16 showed Kamukubu taking down the Jasta Performance Supra of Tyler McQuarrie. Recent Honda convert Alex Pfeiffer was taken down by the AE86 Corolla of Ken Maida. Chris Forsberg put on a good show for Falcon and Drift Alliance by taking out Team Orange member Kazuhiro Tanaka. But Ken Gushi pushed a little too hard against NOB Taniguchi and ended up pretty close to the wall. Andy Yen was taken to the cleaners by Drift legend Imamura. while Kawabata took down NorCal resident Calvin Wan. Reese Millen easily slid his Pontiac GTO past Suyanaga and will meet up with fellow American Ernie Fixman after he got past Kazuya Bai. The round of eight was not as forgiving to the Americans, starting with Chris Forsberg losing to the S15 Sylvia of Taniguchi. NOB will meet up with Kubo Kubo, who was able to squeak past Maida. The only American to make the top four was Reese Millen. A little nervous at the end there by the first American, so I'm very excited. Um, gives us a fighting opportunity to battle our way through. First pass, Reese spun out. But on the second battle, it would be Imamura who lost his footing. With even scores, they went on to a third dogfight. Unfortunately for Reese, who the crowd clearly loved, it was Imamura who had the stronger run. In the finals, it was Imamura's FDRX7 going up against the S15 Sylvia of Kumukubu. The first run looked pretty even, but on the second run, Imamura just wasn't able to get the speed or the angle making Kumakubu the first to win the East versus West D1 competition. Japan taking the first win in what will surely be a long-standing rivalry. Let's go back to the boys at the All-Star 200. We're under yellow flag conditions. This is a little unusual. The three car is coming into the pit. Alan, what's going on down there? Oh, it's got very dramatic now. This is car number three, of course, that was lying second, just 1.2 seconds behind the lead Honda NSX. And he must have had a minor off or something because obviously the car's dropped down and during this, uh, with, the, with the pace car out, he's come in to fuel and have new tires fitted. They need to get him out there before the pace car comes round again, obviously, so he doesn't lose any time. They've held him, I think, at the end there. Yeah, he's held at the end of the pit lane, and he's got him behind that bunch of GT300 cars. That's particularly galling for them. Coming up after the break, we've got the exciting conclusion of the JGTC All-Star 200.
Welcome back to Inside GT Live, the ultimate tuner festival. When we found him, Steve was a dyed-in-the-wool muscle car guy. But after soaking in the GT Live event, Steve's able to see where the future is headed. Now, Paul, I know you're a Subaru man. After all, we're driving in your WRX, but do you ever get Evo envy? I, I do, but, um, you know, I've always loved Subaru. Perhaps a year or two down the road, you might find yourself in a Mustang with the, the, the blown 5.4 that you're talking about. Even after a car club fan lap in a Subaru WRX, Steve had a hard time believing kids would favor forced induction over displacement. It sounds tempting. <laughs> now, I know you work at In-N-Out Hamburgers, the world famous Southern California In-N-Out Hamburgers. Right now you're an assistant manager. Maybe if you get to be a manager of the Cobra, you think? Oh, man, that's, that's very tempting. <laughs> Before our house, yes. Double sauce. Let's go back to the main event. Here they come. Green is waving. We are green, 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 and racing again. We are one lap away from the white flag, and it doesn't look like the 32 car is going to come in for another pit stop. This means if the three car's pit strategy was correct, the 32 car, though he passes the strike first, will be given a 60-second penalty, and he'll end up in second place. Here comes the three car. He needs to stay within 60 seconds of the leader to make that last pit stop worthwhile. White flag is out. One lap to go. Sugio Matsudo going through the chicane. Here's the three car closing the gap. That last lap a lot faster than the 32 car. This will be checkered flag when they get around to us here. guy has got to go another lap around. Though the Pia car passes the strike first, after penalties, it looks like the three car is going to take the win. Allen's with Eric Thomas to help clear things up. I don't think that the full announcement has been made just yet as to uh, what the real results are. But, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a bit of a confusing situation. I mean, it looks like uh, it was like uh, you, you may have seen the movie Lost in Translation. Okay. <laughs> it looks like this is what we kind of figure we get. And on a, the next half it stopped. So I actually made three bit stop. If we, if obviously, if we had uh, stay on the track, we would have been uh, crossing the finish line first. But it would not suit the regulation. We said two pit stop after the lap 50. After the checkered flag, our winner is going to be the number three, Jesox Hasemi Z. Even though the Pia car got through the checkered flag first, they were given a 60-second penalty for only making one of the two mandatory pit stops. Taking the top honor in the GT300 class was the 16 MTEP NSX. Second place going to the Sea West Daishin Z, and third place going to the only four-door car in the JGTC, the Cusco Subaru Impreza. It was a great weekend of racing, and we hope to see everyone here next year. The sights and sounds of GT Live blew us all away. You wouldn't have known it was the first event with nearly 50,000 enthusiastic fans experiencing the action all over the track. Thank you. What we were a part of here today is more than a road race. It's a motorsports revolution. Rip you later, dudes. Thank you. We hope you all enjoyed our hour-long blast at the GT Live Festival of Tuners. I'd like to thank our field correspondent, Steve Mignante, for his unique insight into the world of tuners. Well, thanks, Chrissy. I've had a blast, and now I know there's more to life than drag racing, and I've learned what the steering wheel's used for. Glad you figured that out. I'd also like to thank Alan DeCadene for his awesome job on covering all of the aspects of the JGTC. Well, you know, Christy, I had a ball down there in the pits. I met some great people. I worked with some of the friendliest people I've ever worked with. And all together, a great weekend. And we hope to see all of you out here next year. So mark your calendar for Steve Mignante, Alan DeCadene, and all of us here at GT Live. I'm Christy Albice. Thanks for watching.